So now uh, let me introduce our distinguished panelists, California Secretary of Agriculture, Karen Ross, and author Mark Arax. So Karen has been California's outstanding Secretary of Agriculture for the past 10 years, first in Governor Jerry Brown's administration and continuing on now with Governor Newsom. And I've had the honor of serving on the State Board of Food and Agriculture. So I've had a front row seat for watching Karen's dedication to a strong food system for all. She brings incredible energy, passion and smarts to how best to support the diversity of agriculture we have in California, ensure food access for all, and at the same time, help our state sustainably manage its natural resources. Uh, prior to serving as California Secretary of Agriculture, Karen served as Chief of Staff to Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack in the Ob Obama administration. And before that, she was President of the California Association of Wine Grape Growers, where she helped craft what I believe was the state's first agricultural sustainability program. So welcome, Karen, and thank you very much for being here. Great to be here. Um, we're also very happy to have Mark Arax join us. And uh, Mark, I hope you were able to join through the, uh, get on the panel. Uh, Mark's a journalist and author. He has a, and a, hopefully he'll come on screen soon. Huh. Um, are can you there? You hear me? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. Okay, well, let me let me try to rectify that. Okay, keep, keep, keep I'll going. I'll keep introducing you while you <laughs> look for your video. Okay. So Mark's a journalist and author. He had a long distinguished career with the Los Angeles Times and is the author of several books, including In My Father's Name and The King of California. Um, he's known for his strong reporting and for his storytelling. His most recent book, The Dreamt Land, which I have a copy of right here, is a history of water in California. And Mark is from a family of Central, Val uh, Central Valley farmers and he lives in Fresno. And you still got some time because I'm gonna let people know, Mark, um, how we're gonna use this next hour. So I'm gonna start out by asking Karen and Mark kind of several opening questions. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers from all of you who are joining us. So but please feel free to write your questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen at any time. And uh, when we get to the q and I'll run through those questions and pose them for our panelists. Um, before we get started, it's always really helpful and it's interesting to know who is in the audience. So we've got some poll questions we're gonna bring up for you. And uh, please take a moment to fill these out. There's three questions. First is where are you joining us from in California? So we can get a sense of where everybody's coming from geographically. The second, there you are, Mark. Excellent. Hey there, I got my, <laughs> my expert son with me, so that's good. Good, well, everybody's just filling out some poll questions so we can get a sense of who's in the audience. The second question is what type of organization you're involved with or working with? And then the last question is on a scale of one to five being with five being the highest, how would you rate your level of knowledge about California water and agriculture? And I'll, I'm gonna give everybody a moment to, to fill that out. The Bay Area is winning. <laughs> it always does. <laughs> Give it a couple of more seconds. It looks like it's slowing down a little bit. So um, let's close the poll. So yep, Bay Area one, we've got 32% of you coming, calling in from the Bay Area, but we have people from just about every part of the state. Uh, next was the San Joaquin Valley with about 20%, Sacramento Valley with 16, and then uh, Central Coast and Southern California with 11, and then the remainder out of state. Um, or other. Uh, as far as organizations, it looks like um, most are with nonprofits, almost 30%. Um, but also we have 23% of you calling in uh, who are associated with agriculture in some way. And then it looks like 19% other and then a 10% uh, academic. Um, so that's great. And I'm not surprised, uh, sustainable conservation tends to attract a real diversity of folks to our, our webinars, which is great. And then on a um, scale of one to five for knowledge, we've got a 
pretty, we got kind of all over the board, but definitely the highest was at four. So that's a pretty good level of understanding of water and agriculture at 35%. And then we had 27% more middle of the road with three, 20% uh, of you at five, 17% of you at two and 2% 2 of you at one. So you are all welcome. And we are gonna really try to structure this conversation so that it's accessible for everybody. Um, and uh, everybody gets something out of it. So um, let's see, with that, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Karen. Uh, so um, for those who didn't listen to the first webinar that Sustainable Conservation did on this topic and to refresh the memories of the ones who did, can you just start out by describing what California agriculture is for us and what it provides the state, the nation and the world? And, and also how it's how it's changed over the years. Hmm. In three minutes or less, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, California agriculture is a pretty remarkable part of our state's history. Um, and I think that after a year of COVID where maybe the most exciting part of any day was what am I gonna cook for dinner? And can I get it at the retail store to actually do those ingredients? It's really, it's so vital. It's about feeding us, but it's increasingly becoming also a part of our environmental stewardship, the way in which we're farming um, and, and the way in which we can build and connect communities and be part of a sustainable, renewable energy future as well. It's this land and it's the people who farm this land. Um, for as long as the United States Department of Agriculture has been keeping records, California has been the most productive um, by far. Um, and, and it's a record that we continue to have. The history of agriculture in California actually started with grains and row crops and cattle, uh, but evolved very rapidly um, and has become the powerhouse of really what we can do that few other states and even few other countries can grow. And that's really around the fruits, the vegetables, the tree nuts that we're able to grow in the state because of our Mediterranean type climate um, that allows us to grow this very nutritious plant-based product um, and to grow it the most efficiently of anyone else in the world. So there are several hallmarks about our California farms. First of all, they're a dwindling number. We're now less than 70,000 farms. So that number continues to go down. Um, part of it is consolidation. Part of it is aging farmers and the next generation doesn't wanna come back to the farm. Um, we're diverse because we're, we are a community of immigrants. And so um, the, just the richness and diversity of the foods that we grow over 400 commodities comes from, we, we came to this country and we all, I just got off a call with a number of Southeast Asian immigrants who started growing Southeast Asian vegetables because that's what we know and that's what we want. We are about two thirds of the country's um, tree nuts and fruit crops and about half of the vegetables. I love to tell people if they had a salad for lunch and most of us do, um, a 50-50 chance that all of those ingredients came from California. And right now in particular, they're coming out of the Imperial County, um, Imperial Valley area, Arizona and Southern California, like 90% of the winter vegetables and melons are coming from that part of our state. Um, one of the hallmarks for us is our innovation. California farmers, um, because we're growing in a high value state, a high, high cost state, we really embrace um, innovation, new technologies, backed up with data. That's one of the first things I always say, who'd you do those trials with? And so that makes our university system especially important to us. And one of the best examples, and I have to use this example because today's about food and water and agriculture, is how much we've improved the efficient use of our water. We actually, over the last 50 use, years, are using 8% less water but we are generating 57% more crop and the value of that crop is 96% higher than what it was. When I moved to the state 32 years ago, we had over a million and a half acres of cotton and maybe 200,000 acres of almonds and it's almost completely the reverse. The economists like to say, we're getting more crop per drop so that we are using every drop of water more precisely to get better improved efficiency and, and, and productivity and improve quality. And as we improve our irrigation practices, we also mitigate other environmental impacts like nitrates moving beyond the root zone. So in a nutshell, we are what's nutritious and delicious and we do it in larger scale, 
than anyone else does. And, and it's a tribute to the people and the farm workers and the research community that's helped make this all possible. Yeah, it's, um, it is quite remarkable. I mean, in my 23 years working for sustainable conservation, um, it is amazing actually just in those 23 years how much has, has changed. So thank you. That's a great opening introduction for us. Um, kind of staying at that high level, Mark, you know, you recently published The Dreamt Land, which I don't know, you, I think you were off screen, but I've got a copy here. Um, and that is a history of water in California. And I know some of our listeners today have read it, but I know um, not all of them have. So could you, you know, kind of attempt to provide a high level history of water in California for, to get us started? In, in, in I, I, let's see if I can do it in three to five minutes. Okay, so <laughs> I was, um, I got a call from an old cotton grower friend of mine who uh, retired, sold his state water allotment up and over the mountain so LA could sprawl a little bit more, uh, made a couple million on the sales. And he was telling me about the good life he was living now with a home in Maine and a home on the coast. And he had gotten through the book, um, which was a testament to his persistence. It's 520 pages. And he was asking me, you know, what possessed you to write this? Uh, and because I've probably written more words about California agriculture than, than any writer in the history for whatever distinction that gives me. Um, so this one was followed a book called The King of California. The King of California was a book that began in the 1996 flood. Uh, I got a call from a colleague of mine, Dan Moraine. Uh, in 1996, 1997, and he said, hey, Tulare Lake has come back to life. And I said, what the hell is Tulare Lake? You know, I, I'm, I was sitting like 60 miles from it. I didn't even know the history of it. You know, you could grow up in a place like Fresno and not even know the history of your place. And I think that was the impulse in that book and then in the dream plan to try to figure out my place. In that book, Tulare Lake was the most dominant feature on the California map. And it had been drained dry. And the final draining had been done by these cotton growers who came from the south, the plantation south, and came west. And they brought their mint juleps with them. And they brought their African-American cotton pickers with them. And I found the remnants of that culture in the alkali dust of Tulare. African Americans who had come west following the cotton trail. And as the cotton became more and more mechanized, they were put out of work and they were still living there um, in these kinds of, you know, settlements. And I spent three years documenting their story. And thank goodness, because they're all gone now. They had done something that, that no culture had done. They had come west to follow this thing. The Dreamt Land begins actually in drought, the opposite. And it was in that last epic drought, and maybe it continues, who knows, um, that I noticed that the footprint of agriculture was actually growing in a time of drought. And that sounded so counterintuitive to me. So I went back out and this time expanded the, the reach to the entirety of California. And the book really became the story of the invention and reinvention of the state following water and then following the footprint of ag as it went out and then following as agriculture was converting to suburbia as well. So all that dy dynamics I looked at and there's a huge section in the book that goes back to history. And the reason it does is because I felt that the, the, the model of gold extraction continued today with the extraction and mining of water to the point that we had grown agriculture beyond the sustainability of water. We were going into the ground to pump more and more water out and the ground was actually sinking. And the infrastructure that conveyed California's water from north to south, it was sinking too. The aqueduct was sinking, the key canals were sinking. And so really it's my attempt to understand the kind of madness of California the mania, the intensity of growth and how we could be, the lesson of drought was actually to grow the footprint of agriculture larger. And that is the problem we now face with climate change that can agriculture continue to grow? How much does it have to retract? 
And, um, and, you know, even as all the stuff that Karen was talking about exists, all those things to boast and brag about the invention of, of all of that. So that's essentially what I did. I just followed the water back through the history of California and then to the present and spent, you know, three, four years on the land with these farmers from the biggest ones to the smallest ones, uh, trying to persuade them to tell their story. Well, um, you're right, it's a long book, but I definitely recommend folks uh, read it because it really is quite a comprehensive history and you really do have a knack for storytelling in it. So it, it doesn't feel like a long book. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, Karen, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, uh, so growing food obviously requires a lot of water um, and the state definitely has some serious water challenges, including the, you know, significant groundwater overdraft that Mark was just talking about, you know, that's happening in the San Joaquin Valley, but it's also happening on the central coast and other parts of the state, largely due to more water being pulled out of those aquifers uh, than is getting put back in. So, you know, can you talk about some of the positive steps that agriculture is taking to manage water more sustainably and, and what you expect to see more of in the future? Yeah, so I go back to technology um, and, and more of the precision of when to apply water, exactly how much and exactly at what time. Um, and, you know, a lot of the sensor technology um, and and do, doing the modeling with evapotranspiration and all those kinds of things to make sure that every drop is not being wasted, that it's used precisely. Um, and so that's been an important development and that's where the statewide program for climate smart agriculture was actually, that was something that came out of the drought, which was our on-farm water use efficiency program. That was about using water more efficiently uh, by using less energy and therefore reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that's what, you know, when we come up with programs like this, it's important we remember farming is a biological system. It's not one thing. And so you have to think about it as a whole system. And as, as we try to create programs for good, we have to think about the co-benefits as well as potential impacts. And obviously one of the things many people talk about is drip irrigation, micro spray irrigation, all of that's really great, but we're not, we're not recharging the basin. Well, we are recharging the basin and, and our good friend, our mutual friend, Don Cameron, who's the chair of the state board was a real pioneer and doing intentional wintertime groundwater recharge by literally flooding his vineyards and his almond trees without really knowing if they would survive or be impacted. And he's continued to experiment with that and that's becoming much broader scale. Uh, Mark's book talks a lot about water banking um, and the potential of water banking. So all of those are really good things, but the one thing that we all have to be very intentional about and mindful about as we take on these kinds of programs for the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, we have to make sure we're not creating unintended consequences and we have to make sure all the voices are at the table. And there have been too many communities that have been left out of discussions about water. And that was one of the most painful impacts of the last drought were how many wells and how many small underserved communities lost their water. It wasn't coming out of the tap anymore. And th those are the voices that all have to be a part as we think about these solutions. We're doing clean groundwater recharge. We're not exacerbating the nitrate issues that all the voices are at the table to make sure as we think about this solution that will help this sector of the economy. We're also our neighbors and the communities that that's their drinking water and where we can, are we also being able to mitigate any environmental impact? And in fact, doing recharge, regenerating the land for habitat and, and species. And so those are the opportunities I see farmers really leaning into every day. Great partnerships that I never would have seen 25 years ago with organizations like Sustainable Conservation, headquartered in downtown San Francisco, <laughs> who's focused on partnering with the dairy farmers and yeah, other growers in the Central Valley. <laughs> I mean, Ashley Boren is a pioneer and she has done a great job because of trying to collectively think about what are other aspects of these challenges and how do we lean in and solve them together. So there's new partnerships and there's new opportunities with technology to do even more. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of hopeful things that, uh, that we're seeing. Um, Mark, I'm gonna go back to you, a last question, and then we'll open it up for the 
um, for uh, the audience to, to send in some questions. But you know, you were born and raised in the San Joaquin Valley. You live in Fresno. You know, it's an agricultural powerhouse. Um, what is what's the future vision for the San Joaquin Valley and agriculture that you hope for? So I was um, I was down in Kern County uh, a year ago uh, meeting with before COVID uh, hit, and I was meeting with these uh, big big growers down at the uh, the country club there, um, and we had a, a nice meal, and then I got up to talk, and I basically they, they basically asked me what the future of the valley was, and I said that the future of the valley in terms of agriculture we're probably going to see we have. We're farming six million acres of land here, and we'll probably have to to drop that down to five million acres to make the water thing work. And I, I thought they were going to, you know, come after me, and they didn't. They said we acknowledge that fully that we have grown agriculture maybe a third beyond where it should be. And um, again, that goes back to history. So we when we first took the um, we we first canaled and ditched the rivers, we were farming the alluvial plain, the best ground. And then in 1920, when my grandfather came from Armenia and started growing uh, uh, his grapes, we had the invention of the deep turbine pump that allowed farming to now draw water from the earth. When my grandfather first started farming on the west side of Fresno, the water table was so high that if he just dug a foot or two down, an artesian well would come out of there. It would just spring and gush up. Um, over time, as we kept mining that groundwater, it kept dropping and dropping. The footprint of agriculture as we mine more groundwater kept expanding and expanding. And then we had the technology of drip irrigation. But there's a paradox to drip irrigation. Drip irrigation allows the footprint of farming to now go on land that isn't good land. So we've gone from primo alluvial ground to more, to more midland ground that's still productive to now ground that my grandfather would never farm because it was kind of alkali ground. And it's ground that's outside the reach of a river and much of it is outside the reach of irrigation districts. It's in this wide area, they call it. And this is the ground that we've developed in the last 20 years that's the problem ground. Drip irrigation allows us to take the, the water to a precise root zone. You can uh, then through that same line, feed all your chemicals that you need to. And so you can actually grow an almond tree, a pistachio tree in ground that isn't that good. You can even grow it uphill because the drip line, unlike furrow irrigation, can go uphill. So drip, we have seen, even as it's more efficient, we have seen the water use grow more and more with drip because it's taken us to land that is poor ground. And toward the end of my book, I'm on the land with a guy that I call the Oracle. And he's a farmer and he, we just drive all across Madera County. And he's showing me all the ground that should not have been developed and all the ground that will have to go out of development once Sigma is implemented, if it's implemented to its full intent. So that's where we're, what we're facing right now is what is the future? And I think the future um, is, it could actually be a good one. The worst thing that we could do to this ground is to pave it over with suburbia. We have to find a way to preserve agriculture uh, maybe a smaller footprint, a more sustainable footprint. And we're gonna have to talk about the future of mega dairies. Um, so anyhow, maybe some of the questions we can address are the future of mega dairies, the future of nuts. You know, we have a million and a half acres of almonds now, and the price of almonds have dropped. For 20 years, the almond grower said that the almond crop could, was, was um, impervious to glut. But we're seeing perhaps the beginning of an almond glut now. Mm -hmm. um, great, uh, great setting the stage for this conversation, with Karen and Mark. So I'm going to start going to. We, I can see questions are definitely coming in. Yeah, I wanted uh, to ask a few. Darn it! <laughs> yeah, well, you can jump in too, Karen. You're welcome to. Um, so let's see. I'm going to uh, start out. So the first question is with Sigma and 
B118, and uh, whoever answers this, you're going to have to explain what B118 is because I don't think everybody knows. And for those who don't know the acronym SIGMA, it is the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which was the first major water law passed in California in 100 years and requires uh, water agencies to bring our groundwater basins into uh, sustainable use. Um, so uh, with that caveat, with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and B118, there are no protections for volcanic watershed areas. What can we do to protect ourselves up here? I assume that's coming up a question from Northern California and leg uh, legislative avenues is a question mark. And that was directed to you, Mark, but I think either of you could answer that if you can. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the volcanic areas, for instance, Mount Shasta is not seen as one of the areas that is under this, this, this undue kind of extraction, even as Crystal Geyser and other water companies are up there mining that water and bottling it. So, so there are portions of, um, of, of the aquifer in, in the state of California, some of the, the best aquifer that isn't covered by Sigma. What is covered by Sigma are, are the areas of California that are under the most intense kind of agriculture and that kind of extraction. So there is a loophole in the law and, a, and, a, and the law may eventually reach those areas. Uh, you know, Sigma is a question mark right now. And will the uh, California water regulators have enough staff people to really study these sustainable groundwater extraction plans that the farmers have come up with. You know, the farmers hired um, their experts and the experts have put forward what they think is a sustainable draw of water. You know, one that's not going to keep lowering the water table. And um, obviously, you know, those are done by, you know, their experts. And so the state of California is gonna have to get into that. I mean, some of these things are very esoteric. I've read some of the reports You've had farmers arguing inside their own basins, saying that some of the plans are uh, far too optimistic, others saying too pessimistic. So the state's gonna have to go in there and almost adjudicate this. And I don't know if they're gonna have the manpower and the will to do that. So that's a huge question moving forward. I, I don't know if that answers the question fully. I think it right. answered it at least partially. And Karen, I don't know if you want to weigh in that weigh in on that question as well. Well, yeah, and clearly there's been additional staff that's been brought on and a lot of hours that are being spent to really do the analysis. One of the responsibilities we feel we have as a state is to pull together all the data points. We have a lot of data, but we really haven't been able to pull it all together to really provide that kind of assistance to all the sustainable groundwater management agencies that are out there. So we've done a lot of work on that regard. Right now, we're doing deep analysis of how much water is really available for recharge and those types of places and doing those like one watershed at a time when we need to do all of them concurrently. So those are some of the limitations that we have. Um, and so there's a lot of work going on about that. Obviously, our friends at PPIC will always remind us we need to have like one uniform accounting system for all of this. Um, there's plenty of work for us to do and it requires huge investment and we hope that we're able to do that as a way of supporting each one of these agencies. And again, I need to stress the importance of, and I think this has already been highlighted, of having all the voices at the table to understand how many other communities are impacted as these decisions are being made. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the next question. And this is for either Mark or Karen. Uh, farmers often bear the brunt of harsh criticism um, for their environmental impact and many face brutal economic prospects that drive small to medium sized farms out of business. In your opinion, how do we address farming's environmental impact in a way that enlists farmers as allies and celebrates their contributions to conservation, re regeneration, and all caps makes farming an economically attractive, viable career choice for young people. <laughs> well, there's, Go ahead, the, <laughs> there's the hundred million dollar question. Well, I was just going to ask my new best friend, Mark, who is a fabulous storyteller to help us tell the stories because what I see and have seen, um, and especially as each new generation comes back to the family, is just there's a strong Californians have a strong environmental ethic and so do our farmers and they've been leaders on this, but it's easy 
to, it's not in front of us every day to, to make some assumptions um, ab about what they are doing and why they're doing and when they're doing it. And so the renewed interest in food brings us this opportunity to bring communities together to hear how you're farming, why you're doing what you're doing, when you're doing it, and who else involved in that. Uh, my friend Ken and Michael loves to do these dinners where he brings people together to really do that, and we need we need to focus on that. I honestly believe the work that we have done in the last decade around our Office of Environmental Farming and Ecosystem Services is, is a way of really thinking holistically about all that comes from this land that is being managed by these multi-generation families. That's much more than just the crop that we harvest. It is about how we are taking care of the soil. It is about providing habitat. It is about improving our practices to improve the water quality that's and that we don't have runoff from our lands. And all the work that has been done by farmers to replace their engines and change their practices to improve the air quality in the San Joaquin Valley, which on any given day of the year has the country's worst air quality. You know, these are all programs that we've partnered with farmers. We're providing incentive programs. We're providing technical assistance. And I think on climate in particular, farmers are leaning in and can lead on solutions. Not only can we reduce our own greenhouse gas footprint, but we are one of only a few that can actually draw down carbon, store it in our soil, increase that organic matter, improve its water holding capacity, and be a part of the solution to meet our climate goals to get to to, to net neutrality. So it, it's huge what we can do, and we should all just walk into this together. And we can only do it with partners like yours and other organizations, Ashley. Sorry, I get very passionate about this because I'm so excited and wish I were I warned them that you were so passionate. I part of it every day. <laughs> um, Mark, do you want to add anything? Uh, well, first of all, yeah, I've been around long enough to have uh, known a lot of secretaries of agriculture in the state of California. Karen is, um, by, by my account, uh, the, the boldest, the most cor cor courageous. She, she talks honestly. Uh, she's a great spokesman, spokeswoman for, for agriculture. Um, and yet she's willing to acknowledge these challenges as we move forward. Let me just say about my, the, the San Joaquin Valley. The San Joaquin Valley, you can't paint it with a broad brush. It's actually three valleys. And so you have the east side up against the Sierra, and this is where um, much of the citrus um, groves are planted in the state. And um, it has its own relationship to the water there. There are rivers that run through there. Um, some of the extraction is kind of hard because the ground is kind of uh, rocky, but you can grow um, and, and have a very nice living with 60, 70 acres of citrus. And because of that, the towns on the east side are real towns. They're towns where the children of farmers and the children of farm workers go to the same school. They play on the same football team, the same softball teams. Uh, it's a real place, it's a real community. And um, you have like Exeter on the east side where it used to be that they had more millionaires per, per capita than any town in America. Um, as you move to the center valley, this is where the Kings River and the San Joaquin River and other rivers flow. And um, you see a kind of family farming going on there as well. These are towns like Fowler and Kingsburg. And the water is easy to draw from the rivers as they're coming through. The land is very, very productive. And the farms tend to be smaller too and, and family owned, real communities. Then you move to the west side. Westlands Water District. And there are no rivers running through Westlands. And that land is a uh, kind of problem land. It's got some tremendous fertility in parts of it. And then parts of it are laden with alkali and the soil gets, uh, the water gets perched in the soil. And there, the farmers don't live on the land and the communities are small and very impoverished. They're almost glorified uh, farming, you know, kind of, um, you know, farming communities with farm workers in that kind of settlement, Huron, Mendota. Um, and that there shows that when you have an extraction model, well, you have to go deeper into the ground 
then the 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 rewards of farming don't get spread out, spread out as much. And most of the growers in Westlands are living out where I live in the 93711 um, uh, zip code. So it's hard to look at agriculture with a broad broad brush. You have to go inside these various zones and some pencil out better than others. Some family farming can continue and the kids can take it on and farm on a smaller, smaller scale. What troubles me right now is in the areas where farming is more difficult and it's more of an extraction model, you're seeing more and more outside companies come in and buying the land. You're seeing hedge funds, the Royal Canadian Mounties hedge funds, hedge funds from the East Coast coming in and buying more and more of the farmland. We have some of the, big, the biggest carrot growers in, in Bakersfield have recently sold their operations. One, I think it was in excess of a billion dollars. And this is a trend that bothers me a little bit. It's been around for a long time. There've always been outside investors in the Valley, but it bothers me that more and more concentration of ownership going to people that owners that are living in the East Coast in Canada don't even know this land and it's being farmed by custom farmers here. And this is a trend that is troubling to me. Um, I think this next question follows on uh, something that you commented on earlier, Mark, and actually, again, either Karen or Mark can answer this, but can you comment on why improvements in, oops, just popped out of my view, uh, improvements in water efficiency are often followed by increases in irrigated acreage or crop changes to crops that require more feet of water per acre. Um, so you referred to this mark earlier about drip irrigation allowing folks to go into land that might've been considered more marginal. And maybe when you uh, answer this question, we can talk about perhaps what happened before the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and, and what we expect going forward. Because my understanding is with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, we should be seeing less of that. And I'd be interested to see if, if you guys agree on that. Um. So drip, what drip has done is, uh, you know, it has saved some water in the, in the singular, but it's actually increased the water footprint in the aggregate. And the reason farmers love drip is because it, um, it, it, it can make not so good ground very productive and it really increases yields. And so another paradox of drip is that we may be increasing yield so much on almonds, we're gonna see another record crop of almonds this year. I mean, every year we're breaking records uh, through drought, through flood, whatever. And, um, and that creates um, a, a surplus crop. And, the, and, the, and then the challenge is to try to sell that crop and maintain the price. There was a, you know, the price for almonds uh, we're, we're like $5 a pound before, and it's down to like, you know, two bucks. Okay. So, so at some point it could drop even more. So that, that is, well, there's, there's a lot of um, math involved in, in, in this all penciling out. Sigma will change the footprint of ag. You know, PPIC says that, you know, maybe the San Joaquin Valley has to follow 750,000 acres. I think when you talk to the farmers and you really get out on the land and, 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 and explore it, it's more like a million, a million, one or two. It's going to be a big hit. How do we, how do, we do that and, um, and make the farmer who's idling his land whole? And there's some things that we can talk about as we, um, you know, some ideas that, that, that could, some models that are actually happening out in Westlands that could be an example for the rest of the state. Ashley, I do have to make a comment that um, we farm right at 7.8, 7.9 million acres. That used to be 9 million acres that was actually farmed. Mm -hmm. um, with double cropping, it's about 8.3 million acres that are farmed now, as opposed to what it was. Um, and the total water, applied water used is less. But Mark is exactly right. What has happened is the change in cropping patterns, which is also, it's a very rational economic decision made by individuals with you know, higher costs and where the markets are and what can we do here that can't be done someplace else. 
And I, I um, have to point out that almond prices were extremely high and considered a luxury item. And now as part of a plant-based diet and there are, they become ingredients as well as snacks and follow anybody around to wherever they have lattes and how many are with almonds or, or, or whatever it is. So there's, there's new products that are being made. So, you know, we have, we have to acknowledge that there are clearly different cropping patterns that are going on because at the end of the day, um, whether, whether you're the fifth generation or first generation farmer, you still, you still have to make a living out of doing it. So I just wanted to offer that. Yeah, I think, you know, you're both just illustrating, I think, you know, the complexities that, is complex. that we all face, that farmers face, that the, the, there's a lot of things that are uh, all coming together to, um, that we have to contend with at a pretty challenging time. Yeah. And, and <laughs> uh, if I could say, because of dealing with climate, our land use decisions and our land use policies are so fragmented and driven by very specific local economic needs that for dealing with climate, the land use issues are something we're all gonna to have to deal with and being yeah. smart about it and making sure that we are farming the best and that there is a way, it's not only the farmers that will be impacted by this, but it is their employees and those small communities that depend, what the drought showed us is just the huge drop and charitable contributions to local community organizations during the drought. Mm -hmm. So we do have to think about these very rural communities and what their future looks like as a result of these decisions. Great. Uh, Mark, this next question is for you. And it says, um, if you think we need to reduce the amount of agricultural land, how do you expect us to continue to feed the ever-growing population? So kind of a... Well, I think we could do that through the efficiency. I think we can we can, we're going to have to lose some, some, some land to, to do the water right, okay, to, to, to make uh, groundwater sustain whatever else. There's no doubt about that. The farmers I talk to, the biggest ones, the smallest one, all, they all agree to that. Whose land it is, that's going to be the big question. How do we um, uh, underwrite that, that following? Um, so, you know, a farmer is, 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 is paid for some of that, that, that that's another question that uh, we have to look at. So um, I think there's no doubt with climate change that, that the state of California is going to have to do its land use differently. That's not just agriculture, that's suburbia. You know, we have 10 million people now, a quarter of the state living in the wildland urban interface in the path of wildfire. Even as these wildfires are destroying communities like paradise, we continue to build in that zone. I, I don't know that that is a sustainable model of growth moving forward, just as I don't, I, I don't know that continuing to creep out agriculture into ever more alkali ground is as well. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that in the past, maybe we could have skirted. It was just go, 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 grow, grow, grow. But with climate change and um, the volatility of our weather and really we have a volatile weather to begin with. In California, we don't need climate change to have climate change. It's part of our natural pattern. But as climate change ends up hitching on to our own inherent volatility, we're gonna be seeing these extended droughts, wildfires, disasters that we've never seen before. Yeah. Um, this next question actually kind of tags right on to the issue of climate change. And it says, how do you go about having conversations about sustainability with farmers and growers who aren't willing to acknowledge climate change? And neither of you can take that one. Well, Karen, go ahead. I, yeah, I, I would point to, we started this 11 years ago, just doing round tables and created the specialty crop consortium because specialty crops are what we do that makes us a center of excellence. Just how are you thinking about it what do you see as needs for, at, at that time we were talking about adaptation, it was before we got into the exciting chapter of mitigation. What are the research needs? What is, what is the short-term opportunities here? And just having discussions about how many losses, and we've seen this at scale now that's even more huge, how many losses are happening because of these erratic and disastrous weather-related events. Insurance companies have helped to start start drive that conversation, um, and farmers, uh, you know, they're so accustomed to dealing with weather, which is the day to day thing I'm having to deal with. To think about writ large, 
Um, it's just, it is a change in climate. There is change happening on the land. And I think one of the most remarkable um, conversions I've seen in this is actually happening at national scale. At the national scale, um, a number of national ag organizations and environmental organizations and brand name companies are having conversations and have agreed on the opportunity for agriculture to be part of the solution because they all have to think about sustainable sourcing. And so that shared across the value chain of food and ag is really helping to drive that and to identify this is about opportunities as much as it is about doing something to you. And ag has gotten so accustomed to every new regulation ending up in their lap with huge cost and complexity and not even knowing if you're certain you're doing the right thing. This is an opportunity to share in the conversation of opportunities and solutions led by people who are on the land and with the land. We have so many questions coming in. <laughs> I'm realizing that we are not gonna be able to get through all these and they're all really good questions. I'm gonna um, try to take them sort of in the order that they're coming, but uh, kind of get to things that maybe we haven't touched on yet. So um, here's a question. Is it possible to incentivize growing of water efficient crops through water pricing which is encouraged or required by state regulation. And do you see a future when crops like rice won't be allowed? I just, I'm gonna put a quick editorial in. Rice is an issue that always comes up and it's, this is actually something, Ellen, maybe Karen, you can start with this because uh, you spoke before about, in the sense we, we need to start looking about how we can get multiple benefits for every sort of drop of water right. or air, acre of land. And uh, right. rice is you know one of the best examples of having multiple benefits, so. Yeah, well, and rice has been such a leader. First of all, we, we, we grow uh, the very specific kind of rice. It's our sushi rice, and so it's a high value one. Um, and just what that, what that sector has done when they decided they wanted to phase out rice burning, and through experimentation, they learned that if they did winter flooding, they could become a man-made wetlands in the migratory pathway for a Pacific flyway for 230 plus species of birds every year, that's their hotel space. And that's their paddling activity that breaks down what used to have to be burned. And now the rice farmers of the state have said, we wanna do for salmon what we've done for birds by, by experimenting, by partnering with environmental organizations and the universities to figure out how we can feed them and have them be fat and healthy before we send them out. And so those are the kinds of things that happen. And I'm also, one of the things we have to think about, this is a whole system. Water for transfers, waters for markets, which every time I say that, I start to get a little bit twitchy about what's gonna, I'm a populist <laughs> from the plains. I always think about the small guys in this one, but where's that water gonna come from? And it's going to have the most dramatic impact potentially for rice that now has a whole infrastructure of mills and brands and other things around it. So what we do in one spot is going to be connected to that, but it's, it's so important for us to be partners in doing this and thinking through that acreage and what else it's doing besides that crop that it's, that it's producing for us. Um, and I just realized that people are also putting com uh, some of these questions into the chat box. So let me just go over there. I'm, I'm not going to get to all the questions. We will look at them and see if we can come back to get back to people with uh, answers. But let me just make a quick look over in the chat box. Um, is the California Department of Food and Agriculture making efforts to reference indigenous agriculture and food ways, which would shift what reference point is used regarding the start of agriculture? Hmm. That's, that's an interesting question. I just had my first meeting with our uh, Small Farms Advisory Committee made up of Black, Indigenous, people of color who are first-generation farmers in this state. And one of the things we acknowledged is that the beginning of agriculture in this state goes back to Native Americans and what was done to them. Um, and they, they don't necessarily, the, the people that were on the phone with me don't think of themselves as farmers because being on the land and, mm -hmm. and sourcing from the land is just what, what they do and what they're doing. But we have funded several specialty crop block grant program funds, funds, whatever I'm trying to say here, specifically for this. And that's what we're encouraging. And that's part of having this particular advisory committee is to make sure any of our grant programs can actually carry out these kinds of goals by that, by that particular community. 
Um, so we're starting down that pathway, but it's at the beginning. It's very new. Sounds like a good program. Um, so I want to be conscious of our two uh, panelists' time, which uh, they have been very generous. Uh, any last parting thoughts before I close it up from Karen or Mark? I would just say that um, you know the, the rice farmers that I've met, the Lumbergs and others, um, I mean, they have a real uh, relationship with water and the land up there. They're, they're environmentalists. They are growing salmon now. It's remarkable. By putting that water down those bypasses, they're actually creating the, um, the, 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 the whole web of life that feeds the young salmon. Um, I think the big challenge right now is going to be dairy. And I know I'm going to anger my Dutch and Azorean Portuguese friends here. But uh, big mega dairies that came up and over the mountain from LA, Chino, and then relocated here, they grow a lot of silage, a lot of corn and alfalfa that is water guzzling crops. Um, they, um, they end up polluting with nitrates, the, the, the groundwater. Uh, the cows end up being major pollution sources for the worst air in the country. What are we gonna do with our mega dairies? Um, is, is, is our land and water too valuable to support mega dairies? Should mega dairies go to other states? Um, these are huge questions that are gonna to have to be asked. I know there are methane digesters that are trying to make this equation better, but there is a real challenge here uh, with the crops that are grown and the water intensiveness of those crops. And these are some of the questions that I'm sure keep Karen up at nights. <laughs> and that is a big topic to bring up with, you know, three minutes left. Yeah. But <laughs> it, is a, it is a perfect plug because one of our future webinars will really focus on dairies in California and efficiency and trade-offs and all those things. So um, thanks for that uh, tee up because it is a, it's an important issue. Karen, I'm going to give you a and last yeah, I, I just I, I want to follow up on that. But first of all, I want to thank Mark that he, you know, with his history, he has dug into this and, and uses his unique gifts to write these stories, even if it's painful sometimes to go, whoa, wow, let's talk about dairies. But thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that. And I love your storytelling. And I hope you keep doing this work. And I hope that you'll also go out with Ashley one day when she's doing one of their projects because they've been real leaders and helping the dairy families of the state who are leaning into sustainability, it is much better for us to figure out how to work with them on solutions here instead of just shipping them off to other states. Because Good. guess what? Those other states aren't doing the regulations that we do that make life for a dairy family painful in California. And so if you look at some of the new programs and especially what sustainable conservation, Netafem and some pioneering dairy families have done, to grow their crops better by doing the separation of those nutrients and being able to improve their water use efficiency, their fertilizer use efficiency, and still get a good crop um, on a smaller footprint compared to other states. I think that's where California can lead. We can develop the solutions. And that's why I'm excited about proposals like what the Drive Initiative has for the Future of Food Innovation Corridor, really capitalizing on UC Merced, CSU Fresno, and making sure that solutions work for the smallest first generation farmers and the largest, most successful five and six generation farmers. So that's my view of the future of agriculture in California is that we lean in and work together to be the most sustainable producers of whatever food it is that we choose to grow here. That's my sales pitch. Well, thank you, Karen, for ending us on a positive note. And I, I really want to thank both Karen and Mark for being willing to have this conversation together and with all of us and taking the hard questions and the candid and honest answers. And uh, this is um, this is a really, these are really important issues for California to figure out for so many reasons. And um, I wanna thank everyone who could join us. I'm really sorry we didn't get to the, all the questions. We should have scheduled this for two hours <laughs> given the number of questions in there, but we will try to get back to the ones that we can answer uh, uh, for, um, in those. So. And then I really encourage you to stay tuned and definitely keep connected with us on our website and our email or social media because we will have additional webinars touching on a number of the topics that got talked about today. So please do that and you'll be getting a survey. We'd appreciate you filling that out to that your input and feedback will help inform our, our future webinars. So 
Many thanks to all of you and especially our panelists, Karen and Mark. Thanks, Ashley. This has been really great. I, I'm going to bring my notebook and my mask. I'm going to follow you around. Okay, we're going to, that's the next story. Okay. <laughs> Sounds okay. good. Yeah. Okay. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. Bye. See you, Karen. Bye. Nice to see you, Mark.